All right. Oh, here we are. Here we are. It's early morning my time. I'm on the West Coast and um, we've been planning this for quite a long time and I'm super excited to be here with you all. I'll just underline what Kathy just said. Um, I love to interact with you on the chat for the next 90 minutes or so. We're going to have as much engagement as we can given the Zoom format. It would be a lot more fun if we could be in person, but alas, uh, we cannot. Um, and so we're gonna do our best with this. So I look forward to hearing your reactions, your feelings, anything you need, or if you have a question, you can put it in the chat. And sometimes I might even ask for you to take yourself off mute and make a comment or, um, or reflect on our small group conversations. So we're gonna move into small groups a couple of times. We'll have a few polls and, um, and try to make this as, as fun as possible. Our topic today is kind of broadly how we rise. And I don't know about you, but I'm sitting with um, a continuing struggle with the post or still dealing with COVID-19 um, impact on me personally, on my business, on my family as I'm sure you are as well. It's been quite a couple of years, um, political upheaval, lots of social issues, um, lots of unrest, as well as the backdrop of a global pandemic. So if you're feeling tired <laughs> and you're thinking, huh, I really am not sure how to rise because this has been rough, um, I'm with you. And I'm hoping today that we can talk about that a little bit and look at some strategies because we are moving forward um, as difficult as it is. I want to congratulate you for coming here to the MPA conference. You took the time, you signed up. I can see we have, I think it's 125 people maybe on, 122 people that, um, that made it a priority today to show up for this workshop. You've got a whole week of activities and that's no small feat. You've had to put the work that calls to you behind your family needs and dynamics. And you're doing this to invest in yourself and your partnerships at work. And um, it takes quite a bit to stay focused in a session like this. So thank you and congratulations for being here. I would also love to remind you that because you are here to the extent that you can keep focused here, um, it's even more helpful because um, because it's easy to multitask on these screens. And, um, and Kathy, actually, I'm curious, I did not ask you this in our prep, but what do you think about people putting their video on? We would love for people to put their video on. Awesome. I would love to have videos on because it really helps me feel your energy. Look, there you come, there you come. And to see you. And that way, if we have some large group interaction, um, it's lovely to see your faces. If you're not able to put your video on for any reason, that's okay. It, it's, it's not, you don't have to have your video on, but it really does help with engagement to see each other, to feel each other, even in the limited way that we can. So please, if you can keep your video on and related to that, we're all virtual. So if something's going on this morning, you've got a child that needs you, you have an elder who needs you, your dog barks, whatever. It's okay. It's not a big deal. Everybody's on mute, which will help us manage the sound. Um, sometimes I might ask you to take yourself off mute in a large group check-in, um, but don't worry about it. You're at home. I'm at home. And so we're going to make it, make it work. And you don't need to be embarrassed or worried about the impacts that are happening um, behind you. So, so thank you. Thank you for being here. So I want to start off with just a little bit of music. Music really inspires me and um, it helps me to feel um, emotionally connected sometimes. And this is a song that did come out in COVID. It's actually a cover of a song that came out from um, the artist Alicia Keys. And this is performed by um, a global children's choir. And actually, you know what, I'm going to make sure that I've selected audio on this. Hang on, because sometimes I don't know. I had not. And as this video plays, my invitation to you is to just listen and to feel, to notice what emotions surface for you. And I will probably turn my video off as it plays because sometimes it helps with the bandwidth. Here, I told you to turn them on. Now I'm telling you to turn them off. Um, but, uh, but let's just notice what surfaces for us as we listen to this beautiful children's choir singing the Alicia Keys song, um, Good Job. And I'll allow it also to express a thank you from me and from my company on behalf of the work all of you have been doing, have been doing these last couple of years. You're 
the engine that makes all things go And you're always in disguise, my hero I see your light in the dark Smile on my face when we all know it's hard There's no way to ever pay you back Bless your heart, no, I love you for that Honest and selfless I don't know if this helps it, but Good job, you're doing a good job, a good job You're doing a good job, don't get too down The world needs you now Know that you matter, 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 yeah You're doing a good job, a good job You're doing a good job, don't get too down The world needs you now in the morning as soon as you walk through that door everyone needs you again the world's out of order it's not a sound when you're not around all day on your feet hard to keep that energy i know when it feels like the end of the road you don't let go just press forward You're the engine that makes all things go Go Always in disguise, my hero I see a light in the dark Smile in my face when we all know it's hard There's no way to ever pay you back Bless your heart, no, oh, I love you for that Honest and selfless, selfless. I don't know Thank you so much to our first responders, our healthcare workers, our mothers. Thank you to our moms and our dads. Thank you to our teachers who've helped us. We know it's been hard, but thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. Oops, hang on. It's good, but we don't want to hear it again. I would love to um, have you fire up the chat with what emotions are surfacing for you as you sit with that beautiful song. Spicy chills, somebody wrote. Let's just fire it up. What are you feeling? Tears? Yeah, me too. I can't watch that. I can't watch that song without getting really emotional. Yeah, I needed to hear it. Good. Beautiful, proud. <laughs> verklempt. <laughs> Thanks, Kathy. Encouragement. Yeah, we needed it. Emotional and proud. Cry and smile at the same time. These paradoxes. Yeah, some of you may have seen it before. It did come out. It did come out during COVID. I have um, watched this many, many times, and um, I'm really consistently touched. And I find that it helps me access some of what I've been feeling in COVID that I tend to push away because I'm busy and I'm trying to cope. <laughs> and this video allows me to remember, you know, that I and the people around me are doing a good job. We're doing the best job that we can. And, um, and our children are doing a good job too. And it's been hard. It's been hard on them. 
Thank you. Keep them coming. Yeah. Aren't those kids amazing? They're beautiful voices. Yeah. Know that you matter. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. Thanks for checking in on what you're feeling. We're going to be talking more about the role that emotion and our awareness of emotion plays in how we be resilient. And just being able to let ourselves feel something, even in a song like this, is tremendously powerful and actually is helpful to our healing process. So I wanted to start, I wanted to jump right in and get you feeling, feeling with me and feeling with each other. So we're going to also continue in the spirit of jumping in and do a quick poll. So Jessica, if I could get your help, we're going to put a poll up on the screen. You can see it now. The last 16 months have really been unprecedented, have, have been unprecedented for all of us. How are you feeling? You can pick as many as you want. It's a multiple choice. So um, just make sure you get through the whole list. You might have to scroll down because there's more items than, that might fit on your screen. We'll just leave it open for a little bit until it looks like we have most everybody. Whatever it is that you're feeling, it's okay. And this is just a tiny subset of what you might be feeling right now. You might be feeling things that are not on this list and that's of course okay too. I just couldn't put all the emotions in this poll. Keep them coming, we're about halfway there. Excellent. We'll go for just a few more seconds, maybe 30 seconds or so. Sometimes it's hard to notice which particular emotion we're feeling. Um, sometimes there are primary emotions that we can name and there are others that are more difficult to find the words for. So, you know, take a second and think about it. Um, what am I feeling? What am I feeling in my body? What am I feeling in my heart? What's happening for me after the song and just in general with what you've been doing and keeping up with this past 16 months or so. All right, let's keep it open for 10 more seconds. We have a few more yet to respond. All right, Jessica, let's go ahead and close it down. I think we've got our majority here. So um, thank you for sharing. So look at the results here. Um, our highest vote getter appears to be tired and exhausted. Yeah, 69% of you are feeling that way. I see you, I believe you. A pretty high percentage are also feeling kind of almost a balanced response between overwhelmed and grateful, interesting paradoxical feelings that can be coming up at the same moment. A number of you are feeling burned out. We're gonna talk about that. Hopeful and excited, 41%, that's, that's great. And then some people also feeling stressed or alone, perhaps feeling connected, grounded, frustrated, Disengaged, not uncommon right now. Relieved, yeah. So interesting, interesting. Thank you for your comments. I mean, your, I mean, your scores. Hey, go ahead and put in the chat if you want anything you notice or anything that strikes you as you look at those results. Um, And I'm struck with the variety of emotions. And again, that's not a comprehensive list, but also the preponderance of feelings kind of in the room in this conference that are feeling stressed, tired, um, perhaps even overwhelmed and burnout. So, um, so thank you for sharing that. You're not alone. I think it's one of the things that we really um, can take into our hearts and minds about how we rise right now is that um, we are not alone. Uh, someone else is feeling these things. Now, 
Um, again, I didn't ask every feeling. So maybe you're feeling something and wondering if anyone else is. And a little bit later, we're going to get into small groups and you can ask, like, has anybody felt this way? Most of the time, there is someone who's feeling what we're feeling or something very similar. Um, so just hold this, hold these emotions in your mind as we um, jump into some of our content. Let me bring up my screen again. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about burnout. As one of the reasons I like to do that survey is to see how how are people feeling about burnout. It's a word I'm hearing a lot in the in the world of work. And um, there was a uh, a researcher called Maslach who who studied burnout um, many years ago, and the study has kind of remained a really a, a focus for people. Um, it was originally done for medical providers, and it's since been used in a variety of other settings. And Maslach found there were kind of three common symptoms or um, dimensions of behavior that we would tend to notice in ourselves if we were feeling burned out in our jobs. One was emotional exhaustion, feeling perhaps um, almost emotionless. Sometimes people report feeling numb or they just feel really tired of feeling all the feelings. Um, there can be a sense of depersonalization, like almost a detachment from bad or hard things that are happening. That's not uncommon and definitely a diminished sense of accomplishment. And I'm not sure if any of you are feeling that in your jobs today, but it's again, not uncommon during burnout because we start to feel like we're, you know, grinding away, but the job that maybe once brought us quite a bit of satisfaction uh, doesn't bring it to us anymore. And um, burnout is not a permanent state. It's a temporary state. So if you are feeling that way, as we look at how we rise in, in this strange time period that we're all living in right now in the workplace, I want you to be thinking about yourself in terms of what may you need to do to rise from burnout or from the difficult emotions that you're experiencing. And as Greta said, when she introduced me, I'm a researcher, I'm an author, I own a small consulting company, and I've been working in the realm of people at work for most of my career. Um, originally, uh, early on, I was a therapist and a social worker. I worked with youth at risk um, in a wilderness setting back in the 80s um, with organizations you may have heard of, heard of called Outward Bound and Knowles. And um, I became quite interested during the course of my work, particularly with, with businesses in understanding what is that helps us to thrive at work. And also the question, why do we work? My first book, Fit Matters, How to Love Your Job, is really written for anyone who wants to feel more satisfied in their job, in their current job, or to find a job that's a better fit for them. And Brave Space Workplace is more focused on leaders and how leaders can and should be helping their company really be fit for human life. Because we spend a lot of time at work. And um, if we aren't thriving there, it's a lost opportunity. So I want to share with you a little bit of that content as we go today. And I would invite you to think right now, just privately, maybe jot it down next to you. Um, why, why do you work? Why are you working in the job you have today? Um, and I should mention actually now that we're going to be sending to you a roadmap. It's a visual roadmap that follows the content that I'm covering. And it's going to have 30 days of kind of reflective questions, some of which we're going to start today, but we won't be quite finished, um, for you to reflect on this content and begin to bring it home in your day-to-day -day role. So if you're furiously taking notes, don't worry about it. You're gonna be getting something from us in a PDF version to really um, help you center on this work and, and take it beyond today even into the rest of the conference and into your job day-to-day. -day. So thinking about why we work, I don't know about you, but it gets complex because for many of us, there's many reasons why we work. So I wanna walk through kind of quickly what our research uh, tells us about why we work. And I wrote my first book with my co-author, Cami Dunaway. Cammie's now the CMO of Duolingo. At the time she and I worked together, she was working for Nintendo of North America, and she was actually miserable in her job. And that's what started us being really curious about why are some jobs making us miserable and some jobs are enlivening us. The fact of the matter is we all have the same 24 hours. And if we're working full time, we spend at least eight of them at work. We spend another eight or so sleeping. So it doesn't leave a lot of time for everything else. And so there's a compelling case to say, are we actually thriving at work? And what does that look like? Does this graph look familiar to anybody? The dark green is work and the light green is everything else. There's not much light green on this page. And in COVID times, what I've actually seen in our clients and colleagues is that the light green has gotten even smaller. 
because with working from home, in many cases, there's less firm boundaries between work and home, and we may have trouble turning work off in our mind. We have 24 seven access to our devices so that it can even feel, it can feel even more as though work and the rest of our lives are, um, are so connected that we can't tell the difference. I'm just pulling up my chat. Oh, are you guys not seeing my screen? Can see can see it. It now. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you. I just was checking because it looks like somebody wasn't seeing it. I hope that um, Deborah is getting help from Jessica <laughs> in terms of seeing it. So feel free to weigh in again. I've got my chat open. Um, you know how this strikes you. Like, does this ever feel true for you that work uh, takes over um, your focus and sometimes in your life and what that what that may conjure for you emotionally? So. Our research points to seven things that most of us need from work. And these are not presented in any particular order because one of the things Cammy and I discovered in our research is that the things we need from work are temporally sensitive, meaning they change over time. They also vary considerably based on our life circumstances. Uh, but there is one that tends to come out at the top of the list most of the time, and that is our capacity to meet our basic needs. This has to do with, in a capitalist society, which most of us live in, can we provide food, shelter, water, safety, and security for ourselves and the people that we love? This is about the money that we make, the cash and non-cash compensation. And this one stays in first place for most of us unless two conditions exist. One is that we feel paid fairly. Another is that we can meet our basic needs. So if we feel paid fairly compared to other people and we can meet our basic needs, food, shelter, water, safety, and security, then for many of us, this one falls lower in priority today. Um, that's particularly true for the entering generations, the younger generations, the millennials and the Generation Z that are coming up behind them, um, where they just really are more focus on the other six needs from work as long as they can meet their basic needs. And um, so you might think about that in terms of your own priority. But to go through the other six kind of quickly, we all have a need to contribute. This is about contributing to something that's bigger than ourselves, right? And this is true for the very most frontline, as well as for the chief executive or head of entity. We want to know that what we do matters. And sometimes it's harder to connect the dots about what matters in our job um, in certain jobs than others. I'm reminded of when I was much younger, I worked, I took a job at a hospital because I wanted to live near my boyfriend. I'm sure some of you have made decisions like that when you're young. And um, that job was as a janitor on an acute care hospital floor. So I got to go in at like six in the morning. I got out of there by one or two. And um, I remember being trained, but it kind of was like you know, a little bit blurry for me. I just was told use these chemicals in this order. But about maybe uh, three or four weeks into my job, a woman whose room I had cleaned died. And she had come into that hospital for gallbladder surgery. And I was a bit surprised that she died because gallbladder, even I knew gallbladder surgery was not often that serious. And my boss asked to meet with me and my colleague that also was cleaning that floor. And he told us that she had died from contracting an infection in the hospital. Now I was about 20, 19 or 20 years old. And that was a whammo moment for me in terms of contribution. Because all of a sudden I realized, oh my gosh, I have the potential. My job here as a janitor has the potential to impact whether someone's mother, sister, daughter, or wife comes home from the hospital for a routine procedure. It was really powerful and frightening. And so my boss went back through the order in which we were supposed to clean the room. And I was listening so much more attentively at that moment. I've never forgotten it. This was more than 40 years ago because I all of a sudden had this visceral awareness that my job, my low level entry level job at that hospital actually really mattered. I was contributing to somebody being healthy for a routine medical procedure. So we want to connect the dots for ourselves. And if we're a leader or a manager for the people who work for us. Another need we bring to work is to be seen, to be seen and known. One of my three children, my daughter, um, was struggling in high school, as many children have, with anxiety and getting to school and being responsible. And they got a job uh, at a restaurant as a dishwasher, and they were always on time at that job, never late. And this was a kid who had a lot of trouble getting to school. And I asked them one day, what's going on? Like, you seem really to have no trouble getting to, to the job. It was a messy, hard job, but they seemed to love it. And they said, well, the thing is, they're expecting me. 
this is a huge motivator for us. We know that someone's expecting us to come to work to do the job that we're there to do. We want to be seen and known, have someone know our name, know that we're covering that shift. It matters. And we bring that need right into work. We also have a high need for human connection. We'll talk more about this later today. Brene Brown, who's one of my mentors, I am certified in her approach, Dare to Lead, speaks about our need for human connection being as important to us as our basic needs for food, water, survival, safety, and security. And that's one of the pieces that Maslow, if you may remember Abraham Maslow in his hierarchy needs, he kind of had that differently. He had our need for love and belonging about halfway up the pyramid. But modern researchers point out to us that actually our need for human connection is as important to us as food, water, shelter, safety, and security. If we say that another way, if we don't get human connection, we die. Governments are noting, noticing this too. The United Kingdom appointed a minister of parliament, a new minister of parliament, which they don't, they don't add very often in 2018. And their singular job is to reduce isolation in rural areas. They're called the minister of loneliness. Vivek Murthy here in the United States has declared loneliness an epidemic in our country and men suffer disproportionately from it. So because of how much time we spend at work and because of how basic this need to connect with other human beings is, it matters at work that we connect with one another. This is one of the things that's been so difficult about COVID. We're not in our schools. We're not in our hospitals. We're not in our team meetings connecting with one another. And although we can do it via Zoom, we all know it's not the same. And the reason it's not the same is because we can't feel each other. Our pheromonal limbic brain response cannot transmit across the computer screen. It can come close, but it's not the same. So our need for connection for 16 months has been truncated and bifurcated, and it's causing a lot of consequences for us in our mental health. We, we see that in the data and in the statistics in our homes and in our hearts. Another need we bring to work is to feel supported in taking risks. Now there's a name for this in the workplace. We call it social capital social capital or psychological safety is another term you may have heard. Amy Edmondson has written quite a bit about this. Margaret Heffernan, our researchers who have pointed to the importance of having a team who has our back so that we can say and do the hard thing. Google did a really important research study in 2015 called the Aristotle Project, which showed that psychological safety, having a team that has our back, being supported by our team is the single most important factor of team success more important than everything else, like role clarity and having an agenda and even trust, although trust and feeling supported to take risks are important. So there's no guarantee that when we take a risk that, we'll, that it will all work out. But if we have a team who will be there with us, even when we fail or mess up, it's really quite powerful. It's a need we bring to the workplace. We're getting near the end. Another need we bring to work is to learn to be better tomorrow than we were yesterday. And again, this is a basic human need in any job. Are we learning? Are we growing? Now, the millennial generation, even the Generation Xers have gotten grief from the boomer generation, which is actually my, I'm a young boomer, uh, because they appear sometimes to not be interested in following the typical chain of command. Have you all seen some of this in your workplace where young people enter and they want promotion quickly? They want to be a supervisor. They want to be a manager. And old timers may be saying, but you haven't done your time. What that's about is this basic need to learn, to learn, to grow, to be better tomorrow than I was yesterday. And it appears to be even more prescient in younger generations today, although it's present for all of us, old and young. And then lastly is our need to make our lives work. This is about work-life balance and being able to do the things that matter to us outside of work, like giving care to children, elders, community, pursuing hobbies, resting, taking care of ourselves, getting good nutrition, getting hydrated, making our lives work matters. And this is another evolution that's changed over time because back in the, certainly the generation that preceded me, which was sometimes called the veteran generation, this wasn't really a priority. It, the, the bigger priority was to get a job that made money to support you. And we've seen over the ensuing 50, 60 years that the hunger, the desire to make our lives work is rising in importance. And COVID has only made this more intense where people have seen that they want more from their lives. 
So I'd love to see the chat fire up with which of these jumps out at you right now in your job. Which of these feels the most present for you? And again, there's no right or wrong. It's just sort of fun to see in this group of 120 plus people, which ones are driving you to get up every day and go to work, right? Because that's what we have to do, <laughs> get up every day and go to work. A lot of contribute, I'm not surprised, in the work that you do. Supported and taking risks, beautiful. Yeah, three and seven, so contribute and making our lives work. Feel supported. Yeah, keep them coming. It's really good to see. And it's validating to sometimes know that a certain stage in my life, I might have one that's a priority and at another stage, I might have another. I, when I was a wilderness guide, I really wanted number five. I wanted to be supported and taking risks and having adventure and climbing mountains. Um, and today in my role, I'm much more interested in contribute and making my life work. Um, and so there's no right or wrong, but it's interesting to know and to think about because if we can identify what it is that's calling us to work, we can try to check in. Am I getting that from my job today? If I'm not, why not? Could I change things? Could I talk to my boss about a different focus? Could I flex my schedule? Could I provide a different rhythm to my work days? Um, if I don't feel like I'm contributing, oftentimes when people are struggling, if contribution is a huge value and they feel they can't contribute, it's because they aren't able to see how their job matters. There was actually a great podcast by Shekhar Verdante. If you ever listened to his podcast, Hidden Brain, it was called Bullshit Jobs. And what he did was he went out and interviewed people who didn't know why they were doing the job they were doing. They didn't know how it was contributing. And these were not happy people. And he raises the question in the podcast, if I don't know why my job matters, why am I doing it? Right? So it's really on us and on our supervisors to help us connect the dots. Why does what I'm doing matter? Especially when we have so many people like you here who really want to contribute. You want to contribute. You want to know how does what I'm doing matter. And it's wonderful when you can see the dots connected in that way. So one of the reasons why these seven things about why we work matter so much is that I think that we have had some media pressure to, to make us think that this is about happiness at work, right? The Silicon Valley effect, as I sometimes call it, also puts an emphasis with the 10 big tech companies who get lots of extra benefits, on-site dry cleaning, surface perks, um, makes it look like we're, we're seeking constant, effervescent happiness at work. That's not my experience. Most of us are smarter than that. We know that every day can't be beer and pizza, right? It is work after all. So what we want is over time to thrive. Happiness and thriving are not the same thing. Happiness is super fleeting. Sometimes if I have a good cup of coffee, even on a hard day, I feel happy. But what we want is to thrive over time. And when I look back in the rearview mirror about my own work, I find that some of my best days were also some of the hardest. Days when I had to really stretch, really had to dig in, give it all I had. I can remember as a young mother struggling with juggling and traveling with babies. And, and I think back and I go, oh, I was so tired and so stressed. And yet when I look back at some of those days, I remember the achievements I did with my team, the way that I felt like what I did mattered. And there are wonderful memories. So we need to remember happiness and thriving are not the same. They don't, we don't have happiness every single moment of every day. It's not realistic, but are we thriving over time and, and understanding these seven needs can really help. So I want to give you a chance finally to dig in a little bit to talking with each other. And we're going to put you out in these groups for about seven minutes, Jessica's going to help with this logistically. And my challenge to you is to tackle these three things. Now in seven minutes, you're going to be in a group of, let's say four to five. And so you're going to have to keep it going. These are random groups. So if for any reason you don't like the group you're in, maybe you're with your boss or you're with a colleague and you want to meet some new people, just come back to home and Jessica can reassign you. But you're going to need to not do your regular introduction. Like I'm Mo and I'm from Bend, Oregon, because that'll take your whole seven minutes. So I want you to get right to these questions. I want you first to share one to three words that are describing how you're doing right now. So it might be those feelings we described. Just quickly hear from everybody. And then ask yourself these two questions and hear as much from everybody as you can. How do you want to show up in the year ahead? What are you hoping might be different? And then what do you need? What do you think you need in order to bounce back right now? 
again, you may not get to it all in the seven minutes, but do your best. And um, I look forward to hearing, we're gonna check in as a large group when you come back. I'll, I will be putting these questions in the chat as well when you go out to your breakouts. And so you should get an invitation shortly from Jessica to join your breakout. I'll see you back here in about seven minutes. All right, looks like everybody's back. Thank you, Jessica. Well, welcome back from the land of interrupted conversations, which is what happens sometimes when we do breakouts in this large format. You just get started and then you get the beep that says, you know, okay, it's time to, it's time to come back. But let's just have a little bit of a large group check-in right now, either in the chat or take yourself off mute. I'm scanning my screen. I can see when the yellow triangle comes up that you might want to say something. What struck you as you were connecting with your colleagues about those questions? What struck you? Um, Mo, I would say in our group, I think that we all had the same um, the same common words came up, tired, emotional. Um, you want things to kind of get back to normal, whatever normal is going to look like. Some of the same things came up with each person who responded. Mm. Yeah, thanks, Greta. Real consistent themes. I'm seeing that in the chat as well. Some overwhelm, looking forward to, new, to structure and a new normal. Looking for for a vacation, yes. Good. Anyone else want to say something? Take yourself off mute. I know it's um, hard to, yeah. This is Anne Marie in Alaska. Um, our group really talked about how overwhelmed we are, <laughs> and that many of us are year, are nearing retirement age, and this has been such a hard year. Um, with less staff, um, not being able to hire, or just playing more work. I mean, the waivers alone are more work, and the, the poor people do in PEBT as well. That's a full-time job. Um, and we're like, we're just to, to hear, like one more thing. You know, if I, I said, if I was 60 on my last birthday, which was, I'm getting close, I would have called it because I have retirement benefits. And that's not a fun place to be, to, to be at your job going, there was only two years older that's a really bad place to be and I think a lot of people are at that place yeah thank you thanks for sharing that Anne Marie it sounds really really hard and I get it I'm seeing in the chat and other people are are feeling similarly kind of at the end of their mm -hmm. rope around tolerating it looking to end kind of their their current role or to move get some relief yeah wanting balance to come back. Some people worried about successorship. Um, yeah. For me, I felt an overwhelming um, relief that the USDA gave us the waivers and that we were able to do our work. We were able to meet the needs and feed the kids. You know, in Michigan, our numbers went up. You know, we reached more kids than we would during normal times, it, just different programs. Um, you know, I, I'm just, I'm grateful for that. And we found a way and it worked. We learned something new. Beautiful. Thanks for that, Bob. And yeah, it's a silver lining, right? There's, there's some, I love that you underlined learning. There's learning happening too in this time of hardship. Um, and I agree with what was said in the chat about, yeah, you have been essential workers. It's mattered what you've done in this hard time to the people that you serve. Um, so there's something good about that too, even as hard as it's been, you know, both things can be true at the same time. We can feel burned out and like, we just want it to end. And also we can feel grateful and excited about what we are doing together. We can feel both at the same time. We don't have to, we don't have to only feel one, you know? Um, so thank you. I think there's also this added level of, of frustration and guilt that, mm. that I've experienced, um, so yes, I agree. Waivers have been absolutely wonderful. We've been feeding astronomical number of children and serving a ton of meals. However, there comes a, a time where it's like, can we get back to normal? Can we get our programs back to what it needs to be? And so there's that guilt of, yes, we're feeding a lot of children, but we need, we need to get back to what is our program and what is the purpose of our program and, and the requirements and the things along those lines. And so I've, I've struggled with that of yay, we are feeding children. And that is our ultimate goal is to feed children. But at the same time, like when, when do the waivers stop? Like, when do we get back to that normal seat? Yeah. 
Thanks, Megan. And it's interesting that you say that because I've been thinking a lot about the word normal because in every sector that I work in, there's a lot of energy that's sort of saying there isn't actually any new normal. Um, and in some industries that have been resistant to change, an example I'll use is, um, is medicine where many institutions had to pivot majority of their care to telemedicine, which was quite difficult on many providers. Um, and now that telemedicine is being provided with success in so many areas with so many patient populations, there's a lot of medicine that won't be going back to in-person visits. If there, isn't, there isn't a normal that they're gonna return to. So, what, so the question becomes, what does it mean now? Like, okay, if we now have like more telemedicine than we ever had, what is that, how's that gonna shape our institutions? Um, and so it's powerful what you're saying around longing for what was normal and then also sitting in that ambiguity of like, what is normal now? What is normal going to be like now? Because it may actually be fundamentally different than it was prior to COVID-19. Yeah. Good stuff. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a lot of good stuff in what normal was. Um, and there may be some changes in how you execute your work that um, that last for a long time. So that, and I like what, what Darcy just put in the chat, the, the free for all constant change is not sustainable. I agree. We have to begin to settle into some anchoring, even if it's a new normal, what is that predictable pattern? Because we, we can't sustain change, change, change all the time. Um, and we see this, of course, in lots of sectors, education, you know, even business. Um, and so I agree, I agree. And so how do we anchor down to those things that are now um, new ways of doing things? Yeah, not enough resources to do what is asked. Yep, I believe you. Thank you. Thank you. Good stuff. Well, let me move on. I want to offer you some tools, right, for like how we, how we, step into this area and how we rise in the new normal, hopefully bringing back some of the things that we treasure that really worked before and also take, taking some of that learning and doing things differently um, based on what we have learned during the pandemic. Um, let's look at some tools for how you can do that. So let me share my screen again. I love, I love the large group conversation, by the way. Thank you so much for being brave and speaking up. Um, it's hard to do in a group of 120 of your peers from around the country. So I have um, come up with a definition of the kind of workplace that I dream of. This is what gets me up and going to work every day. I call it a brave space workplace. It's one where people can show up as they are, both perfect and flawed and do great things together. A brave space workplace activates, enlivens, and tenderly supports the very complex humans that we are so that we can bring all of ourselves to work every day. And this is part of how we get those needs met. And it's also, many people read this definition and they, they say that I'm living in a fantasy world because um, it's hard for them to imagine a place where they and others can show up every day and do great things together with all of our mess. Because as humans, we are not machines. We're a lot more complex and interesting. We bring our stuff to work. And managers around the land know, many of you who are leaders also know that one of the most expensive things in any organization is dealing with employee tur turnover, right? Employee churn, losing a good employee is very expensive. I'm sure it's true for you as well, especially once you've trained them, a colleague or an employee. But there is something more expensive than losing employees to other jobs. And that is employees who are coming to work on your team or in your group every day, bringing a mere fraction of their great stuff. Because that employee is holding a full-time position, but they're bringing just the very surface of what they can do. And so this is where I think a Brave Space Workplace framework becomes so powerful is what would it look like if actually all of us felt more turned on, more excited, more that we could bring our full selves to work. This of course also touches on the very important dimension of workplace health of diversity, equity, and inclusion. What if all of us felt a sense of, a sense of belonging at work and that we could bring our full selves to it? Would we in fact get more results by bringing all of ourselves to work every day? And in my framework, there are really five levers. Actually, um, this is only showing four, so there's one missing. We're not gonna spend much time on these. We're gonna focus mostly on the first lever for the rest of our time together, the human essentials, which I call the who. There's really two parts of the who to this kind of workplace. One is leaders who have head and heart habits. 
and another is teams who care. And they actually matter equally, although we know our organization through our immediate boss. So in some ways, our immediate supervisory relationship has a tremendous impact on our experience of the workplace. But the other levers matter as well. The what, a conscious culture, the where and when, which is purposeful design and anything that has to do with how people work, performance management, how we hire, how we fire, how we plan for succession, how we meet, how we do Zoom calls. Those are all design elements that can either hinder or help how human beings show up. Meaning and context, which is that piece about what does our organization exist? What does this particular job exist? Why does it matter to me? What does it matter to the world? And the fifth lever that for some reason fell off this slide is what I sometimes call the soft stuff, which circles right back to the who, but it's very particular around inclusion on creating cultures where diversity is present and people from all different dimensions of identity across race, gender, heteronormativity, et cetera, feel that there's a place for them there. Um, that is a really important lever that we pull from. So looking at this first one though, for our work around how we rise um, has some particular imp implications, I think for our time. And I do wanna leave you with some tangible skills. So from where I sit, there's two questions that really matter around how we view ourselves in the context of work. And you can see them on the screen right now. Who am I and who am I with you? And they seem super basic, like who am I? What's my background? What's my name? Where do I live? But when we scratch beneath the surface, we can see that there's a lot more there because it includes why do I work? What pushes my buttons? What do I dream of? What do I hope for? What's my personal circumstance at home? What bugs me about you? What am I good at? What am I not good at? And we could go on and on. And all those same questions come up with, who am I with you? What pushes your buttons about working with me? What do I like about working with you? What about you makes me feel anxious? How are our jobs interdependent? How are they not interdependent? And it's the answer to these, these questions, these two seemingly basic questions that often creates the capacity to figure out how we rise together. And we're gonna look at that more closely together. So I have used this equation quite a bit during COVID and, and um, I came up with this partly because I, um, I was hearing so much about, um, I'm noticing people are still getting black screen. I apologize, Deborah. I don't know. I'm completely at a loss about how to handle a black screen because the only thing I can think of is that there's something about your computer um, so I'm going to let Jessica one-on-one -on -one try to support you and troubleshoot that. So I, I apologize, Deborah. That's super frustrating when you're not getting the visuals. Um, but I will make sure that you get the roadmap that I mentioned, which will have this content in it as well. And we can also share the slides with you afterwards. But what we're looking at, we're getting some good ideas in the chat too, that you could try. Thank you everybody for jumping in to help Deborah. Um, so I was hearing a lot in COVID about the importance of self-care and self-care is important. Ultimately, we are responsible for our own well-being. But self-care to me is not enough in these times of how we try to reinvent the new normal. So I came up with this equation, self-care plus team care equals a healthy, cohesive community. And I think that we do better at work when we really emphasize team care, our interconnectedness our mutual support. We also have to pay attention to self-care, but what we're ultimately going for is a healthy, cohesive community, both our team at work, our bigger organization, and the communities we serve that are vibrant over time, going back to that vibrancy word we looked at earlier. So we're gonna, I'm gonna offer you a couple of tools in each of these areas, and I wanna start with self-care. One of the really important parts of self-care in these times that I, feel matters is the development of a courage practice, a courage practice. And this is what has drawn me to the work of Dr. Brene Brown. If you don't know Brene's work, I would highly recommend you could either look at Netflix um, for her special called Courage. She also has a very widely viewed TED talk on vulnerability, one of the big ones. It's like the top 10 most viewed TED talks of all time. That was the one that made her really become uh, popular. And Dr. Brown's research really points to the idea that whenever we're being brave, we're also being vulnerable, that courage and vulnerability are twins. And the development of a courage practice allows us to show up in our lives, in our worlds, even when there's no guarantee of what the outcome is. And to do it in a way 
that is not overly self-protected. And I'll talk more about that. And when we say vulnerability, here's what we're talking about. Vulnerability is an emotion we experience anytime we step into uncertainty, risk, and emotional exposure. And we were just talking about that in terms of the new normal and how hard it can be to have constant change. We feel very vulnerable when everything's changing, when we don't know, like, how are we going to be doing work tomorrow? Are we going to be remote? Are we going to be on site? Is this grant going to come through? Are these vouchers going to be real? It creates vulnerability for us, a strong feeling of uncertainty, risk, and emotional exposure, because we're not sure how we can show up well in this environment. So it's that exact moment when we're feeling vulnerability, when we are also being the most brave when we're really stepping into courage. But what's tempting for all of us to do is to protect from that feeling of vulnerability because none of us like to feel vulnerable. And then we stop taking risks. We stop showing up in our authentic story. We stop connecting or having hard conversations that really matter. So growing our capacity to be brave by stepping into vulnerability, even when we don't know if there is a guarantee for success is important. And, um, and so I invite you to think about that and to perhaps dig in and do some more research on these concepts. One of the things that we know is true about courage is that it's highly contagious. Now, anxiety is also very contagious. So in a team, if your team is highly anxious, you can counteract that by thinking about how you show up courageously, which doesn't mean showing up with all the answers. It means showing up with vulnerability. I can remember as an example, when COVID first hit my business, which is a training and consulting business, ground to a halt in a matter of days. We went from having best year ever to nothing on the books. It was terrifying for me and my staff. And as the head of the organization, as the CEO, I was anxious and scared. I felt very vulnerable. And I remember thinking, what should I do? I need to have a team meeting, but what should I do? I don't have answers for them. I don't know how this is gonna play out. I don't know if I'm gonna guarantee their jobs or even mine. So I decided to choose vulnerability. We had a staff meeting and I said basically that. I'm not sure what this means for us, but I'm, I am sure that together we're gonna figure out something that works, right? So I needed to stay in my leadership role of hoping for a solution, but I also needed to be open to expressing that I too felt vulnerable. And when I did that, my staff were so grateful because they were scared and they saw me not pretending that everything was gonna work out and it helped them feel that I was more human and more in the work with them. And the braver I was, the braver they became to say the hard thing and to do the hard thing. And we did get through um, COVID with some creativity and some innovation uh, that we never have thought of in the past. So courage is really contagious. Now, the other reason a courage practice matters so much is you may be seeing in your teams some of these things that are on the left. And do feel free to weigh in if there's any that jump out at you an avoidance of tough conversations. Deborah, I'm just gonna read this list because I know you can't see the screen. What's listed on the, on the right, what's on this page are barriers to courage. And some of the barriers that are listed are difficulty or avoidance of tough conversations, fears and feelings, corroding trust, which is trust that's going backwards, getting stuck in setbacks, like this didn't work here before, it's not gonna work now, or we failed once, we can't try again a lack of innovation, a problem solving or an action bias, which is the tendency to jump to a solution before we actually understand the root cause, a lack of inclusion, diversity and equity, shame and blame, gauzy values, which are values that are kind of vague and not, not very behaviorally grounded, and perfectionism. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry to sneeze in your ears. Perfectionism is actually a lie. And if we have any recovering perfectionists, feel free to raise your hand, right? Perfectionism is the story we tell ourselves that if we get something just right, everything will work out. And it's a lie because what's true is even if we get everything just right, things might not work out, right? So this is why we prefer to perfectionism, we prefer healthy striving, which is stepping in knowing we may not get it 100% right. And even if we did, there's no guarantee, but we're gonna show up anyway. Now, these 10 things that are listed on the left are what the research tells us are barriers to courage in organizations. And so in order to be brave, we can focus on counteracting these by learning how to have hard conversations, how to ask for what we need, how to build trust, how to create inclusion, diversity, and equity in our workplaces. How to not be so perfectionistic that we don't try to do hard things. 
something I'd love for you to think about, and this will be in your roadmap as well, is what is your call to courage? Where do you want to be braver in your job today, in your life today? Maybe it's with a specific colleague that you're struggling with. Maybe it's with asking for a promotion. Maybe it's with redesigning your work life so that it works better for your lifestyle. What's that thing that maybe makes your palms sweat because it feels exciting and also terrifying? That may be your call to courage. And if you can notice your call to courage and begin to be brave towards that, it does help build resilience and recover from burnout. And when we talk about courage, we are talking about our capacity to bring our whole selves to a situation. This is an integrated self. And you can see this stool to me is a nice metaphor. There's three parts of our identity on, you know, under the hood all the time. Our thinking, which is our brain, our cognition, what we know, our feeling, which is our emotions, which we started our time out, our affect and our doing, which is what everybody else can see. All that other people can see is what we do. They don't know what we're thinking or feeling. And most of us, if we think of ourselves as having this three-legged stool, most of us have one of these that maybe is a little bit atrophied or like we haven't worked it out a lot. And in fact, in the world of work, I see often that it's feeling or affective side that's become a bit atrophied because history tells us that emotions shouldn't be brought up at work. Our post-industrial revolution way of navigating work was to stuff our feelings down and pretend they didn't show up. And unfortunately, all they did was leak out in corrosive ways in the workplace, like gossip, useless complaining, triangulation. So we want to shore up that feeling muscle because our emotions have a lot of relevance to our partnerships and to how we work. Now we're still in the self-care dimension of that equation. Self-care plus team care equals a healthy, cohesive community. So in addition to a courage practice, the other tool I would love for you to think about really getting good at is self-compassion. Self-compassion is also sometimes thought of as empathy for self. And Kristen Neff, you can actually look at her website, kristenneff.org, is a self-compassion researcher. She has a little assessment you can do on her website to see how your self-compassion self-compassion practice is going. But I can tell you right now, most of us are terrible at it. Most of you are probably also terrible at it. And so there's three parts to it that matter. One is, do I have the capacity for self-kindness versus self-judgment? Can I talk to myself in my own head like I would talk to someone I loved? And most of us don't talk to ourselves that way. We say things to ourselves like, how could you be so stupid? Or who do you think you are? And we would not say that to someone we loved, actually. We would probably say things to them like, good job. You're going to figure it out. I believe in you. So what happens if we start talking to ourselves that way more consistently? It elevates our muscles of self-compassion, which help us show up more wholeheartedly in work. Another piece of self-compassion is to recognize our common humanity versus always feeling alone. That's one of the reasons I asked you to identify your emotions earlier, because I noticed a lot of you on the chat said you felt less alone because other people are feeling similar things. We are not unique, special snowflakes, actually. Our human experience is common with all humans, especially our emotional footprint. So when we recognize that, we become more capable of being resilient. Oh yeah, I will rec I will mention that. And I'll actually, I'm going to put it in the chat too. So the person whose website I mentioned was Kristen Neff and her website is, oops. Oh, the only thing is I'm not sure if it's Kristen with an I or Kristen with a E at the end. So it's either Kristen Neff or Kristen Neff, um, dot org. You can find her work. So the third part of self-compassion is where we develop a capacity for mindfulness versus over-identification. This is where we learn how we can notice what's happening without always having an intense reaction to it. We can say, yeah, this is hard right now. Yep, but I'm not gonna over-identify with the struggle. I'm gonna remember that this will pass. I'm gonna be patient with myself, that I'm doing the best that I can, even if it's not all working out right now. Because what can happen when we're not being self-compassionate is we over-focus on the things that aren't working and we lose sight of the resilience we're bringing to the hard thing. 
So self-compassion is a really, thank you with an eye. Thanks, Melissa. It's a really important skill. And of course, the more comfortable we are with self-compassion, the better we'll be with empathy, which is another important skill that I'm going to share in a moment. So the idea here with self-compassion is that we must know how to put our own oxygen mask on first. Because if we're not taking in air, if we're not grounded and upright, we're not going to be much good to anyone else. Not our colleagues, not the people we live with, not our boss. And only we can put our own oxygen mask on. Only we can take care of ourselves. And that includes sometimes the basics. Are you getting enough water? Are you getting enough sleep? Sleep is one of the most important things to pay attention to when we're trying to rise. And we shortchange it all the time. Am I eating healthy food? Am I moving my body sometimes? These are ways we self-care. Am I asking for help from people that I live with or work with? Now, this is a bit overwhelming to look at this image. This is the feelings wheel. And you can see in the center, it's hard to read, but there's some basic feelings, mad, scared, sad, powerful. And then radiating out are all of these more nuanced feelings, discouraged, inadequate, daring, fascinating. And I love to show this when we're thinking about self-compassion because it reminds me just how vibrant our emotional landscape is as human beings. Now, we may have been taught by society at large that the only emotions that we feel are mad, sad, and glad, but that's not actually real. We feel much more nuanced emotions, often contradictory emotions at the same time. So part of self-compassion is to dig into what those feelings are and to give ourselves permission to be feeling them. And they might be contradictory. I might be feeling amused and remorseful at the same time, right? How interesting. So we notice when we're being self-compassionate, we can notice the feelings without becoming overly attached to that one feeling because emotions pass, they pass through us. Now, the other tools that I wanted to offer you to think about comes from the work of Emily and Amelia Nagoski. We're going to be moving into small groups here in just a minute. Um, in their book that came out right before COVID called The Secret to Unlocking the Stress Cycle. And this is a particularly powerful book for any of you that are really feeling burned out right now. What the Nagoski sisters have done is connected our biological response to stress to burnout. And they talk about the stress cycle is the moment at which our bodies learn that when we face danger, we're now safe. So it's a physiological response where we survive something hard and our bodies complete that cycle by saying, whew, we did it. This is also, this happens in animals. She talks about, they talk about predator and prey and, and how it's a physiological response. And the reason I like this work so much is it helps us remember that we do have a body right? And um, our body is how we process emotion and hard things, right? And so thinking about our stress cycle, we need to sometimes get a little bit out of just our head and our feelings and also think about what's happening with our body, which is a, we are after all animals and our body is how we process hard emotions and how we process stress. And I want to just comment, Jessica is putting in the chat that if somebody's called in by a phone, and um, are using a computer for video, could you message Jessica directly with your phone number so that she can connect you to your computer name? Because that'll be helpful on the next breakout. She needs to match you, your video and your, and your phone. Um, so please do that. So the way this stress cycle work looks is that we experience a stressor and we have a reaction. And then the way we complete it is by processing that reaction. But what happens for most of us, especially if we are um, in a very dynamically changing environment, which many of us are right now, is that we just go stress, reaction, stress, reaction, stress, reaction, and we never give our bodies time to process that stress. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Right? We're just reacting to stressors and we don't feel like we're processing it. So we get layer upon layer of stressors, which over time, of course, creates burnout. So the Nagoski speak of seven ways that we can complete the stress cycle. And these do not look like rocket science, but let me tell you from my own experience, they're extremely powerful. And we need to complete the stress cycle on each stressor, right? So I, for example, was working on this model with myself and I had a couple of stressors. My mother was in hospice and dying. I had a child who was in trouble. 
my business was struggling with COVID issues. And I needed to work one of these stress cycles on each of those issues, <laughs> right? And so the seven things you can see on the screen, again, they don't seem that complex, but they're very powerful. One, which most of us know is physical activity to get on out there and move our bodies. And this is not light physical activity. This is like actual getting your heart rate up, moving your muscles, pushing hard. Our bodies without physical activity, they sort of hold on to those stressors physiologically. And when we get our adrenal system going and we get our hormones going with physical activity, a, a strenuous walk, a dance, a run, a weight lifting, anything really, we move that stressor through our body. Another way to complete the stress cycle is with what the Nagoskis call your crew. This is about turning to the people in your inner circle and letting them support you. Saying to your spouse or partner, I need help. Can you help carry the water with chores? Asking a friend to listen to you on a walk because you've had it up to here, right? When we turn to our crew and we ask for help, it does facilitate our movement through the stress cycle. But most of us tend to take a rugged individualist mindset and we don't ask anybody for help. We just suffer alone. Right? So we need to learn how to turn to our crew. Breath work is super powerful. Some of you may already be having a yoga practice or a meditation practice. This has always been quite a hard one for me. I'm not very good at yoga. I'm too active, I think. But I've really become convinced of the power of breath work. And it can be something very simple, like you might have heard of the term four square breathing, which is where you just breathe in for four seconds you hold it for four seconds, you breathe out for four seconds, and you hold it for four seconds. Usually you breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth. Doing that kind of breathing, even in a hard meeting or a difficult conversation, can really slow down your stress response and also will slow down the person that you're talking with because we tune into each other that strongly. We need to take in air and it helps us reduce our stress cycle. Laughter and crying are kind of two parts of the same coin. Just good old be belly laughter, watching a funny show, playing a silly game. My family and I during COVID one night had just an uproarious game of charades and we just laughed so hard. I'm sure nothing was even that funny, but it released the stressors that we were feeling. And a good cry can do the same thing. In that period I mentioned of a lot of stressors, I remember being out for a run one day and it just hit me my grief, my pain about my mother's passing. And I just stopped and I put my hands on my knees and I just sobbed all by myself out there. And I was kind of embarrassed, even though no one was watching me. I don't like to cry. Who does? Right. But I felt better because that piece of my grief was beginning to move through my body. This is what we want. We want to help our bodies move these hard emotions through us. And then creative expression can be anything that you do creatively. Maybe you're a painter. Maybe you like to make jewelry or make quilts or cook or build things out of steel. Creative expression helps us move through the stress cycle. And the last one I kind of skipped over is affection. This is very specific. According to the Nagoskis, it's, they actually are referring to a 20-second hug. There's research that points to turning to someone in your inner circle and hugging them while you're standing upright. So you're not leaning on each other, but you're hold, holding each other in a light embrace for as long as 20 seconds, physically, physiologically reduces the stressors that your body is experiencing, the chemical reaction that's happening when we're feeling stress. It's the accumulation of those chemical reactions that contributes to burnout. So each of these seven things ought to really help you process through those stressors. We have a joke in my family of like, this has only been 15 seconds now. We have to hold, it seems like a long time to hug someone for 20 seconds, but it's wonderful. So what we want to think a little bit about as we're looking at these self-care tools, okay? A courage practice, the willingness to be vulnerable, self-compassion, and physiological interruption of the stress cycle. We want to also be noticing the ways in which we self-protect from feeling vulnerable. Self-protection is also sometimes called armor. And armor feels good because it keeps us safe, but it also keeps us alone. So some of the things that I mentioned earlier, like for me, one of the ways I sometimes self-protect is I don't ask my team or my people at home to help me. I try to do it alone. It's a way I self-protect. 
but that armor doesn't help me. And so even though it makes my palms sweat, I'm learning how to ask for help, right? So that I don't have to always be armored up and self-protected. So the second piece of that equation, I've talked about some tools with self-care. I wanna look now at some tools of other care, team care. And the same basic rise skills undermine team care, or not undermine, underpin, which is that knowing the emotional landscape of yourself, we've talked about that, but also of your team, allows you to tend to fears and feelings. So when we're thinking about learning how to rise, we would all do well to become more aware of what's happening with other people emotionally. In the field of emotional intelligence, we call that social awareness. Can we tune into and validate the experience of another person? When we do that, they feel seen and it builds trust between us. So we are paying attention in emotional intelligence to personal awareness and also social awareness, being able to read others and to tune in to others' emotional states. Now, connected to personal awareness and social awareness of emotions is a, a, another tool. I have two more tools I want to share before we go back to small groups. This one is called BIG. It comes from Dr. Monet Brown, and it's a really wonderful team health tool, I think. What BIG stands for is boundaries, integrity, and generosity. And when we practice big in our teams as part of that team care, things go better. So boundaries is where we define what is okay, what is not okay. I had a client recently who was in a pretty big conflict with one of his colleagues. And the colleague said, I can't talk about this right now. I need some time. And two weeks went by. And my client said, I'm really frustrated because it feels like it's just hanging out there as a conflict. So he called him up and he said, it's really okay that you needed some time to process our conflict. It's not okay that you avoid me for much longer, <laughs> right? I want to talk to you about this. Maybe there's a missed deadline on your team. It's okay that you missed the deadline yesterday. It's not okay that you didn't give me a little heads up the day before that you were going to miss it. Okay. We can really grow our team health by creating more clear boundaries. Integrity is where we do what we say we will. It's where we live into our values. We walk our talk. And this is about not over-promising and under-delivering. It's really important to building team trust. And last, which is my personal favorite, is giving people the benefit of the doubt. This is where we assume that people are doing the best they can. Instead of what most of us assume, which is they are just doing a bad job. <laughs> and when we believe that people are doing the best they can, all kinds of things become possible, okay? Because when we think of ourselves, like I'll use myself as an example, I sometimes am doing the best I can and I can do better tomorrow, right? Those two things are not antithetical, but a spirit of generosity gives us acceptance and empathy with our colleagues that we're not assuming negative intentions when they make a mistake or they say the wrong thing or they drop the ball. So boundaries, integrity, and generosity are really powerful and simple tools to think about when it comes to team health. And don't worry, we're gonna have time for questions on these because I'm sure they're coming up for you. So the last tool, and I've already referenced it like 10 times, is my favorite. It's the tool of empathy. For me, empathy is really central to how we build trust and how we rise from hard things. And there's four steps to it and we've added a, fit, added a fifth. You can see them on the screen here. Perspective taking, step one. Staying out of judgment, step two. Recognizing emotion, step three. And communicating emotion, step four. The fifth we add from the work of Chris and Neff, which is about mindfully holding space. You'll notice that there is no step five that says fix the problem for the other person. Okay. So for those of you that are good problem solvers and you do pretty good with steps one through four and then you ride in on your white horse and you say, no problem, I've got this, you're not helping build connection. What you're conveying is you can't handle this. Let me take it on for you. Not helpful, not helpful. 
So let me just unpack this a little bit more because there's a lot of nuance to empathy. Perspective taking is believing someone's story, believing that the way they see it is real and true for them, even if we don't agree. Saying out of judgment is not having an opinion about the rightness or wrongness or goodness or badness of what they did or what they should do. Recognizing emotion is where we tune in with that social awareness to what they might be feeling and we're often guessing. And then the last and most important part is we connect that emotion to a time we have felt a similar emotion, which is what contributes to us feeling seen in empathy. Now people get all tangled up in empathy because they think they have to have experienced the same thing. People say to me all the time, like, I didn't, I never got divorced. I don't know how to be empathetic for someone who has. You don't have to have been divorced to know loss. Okay. It's the emotion that underpins the experience that we're connecting to. One of the most powerful examples of empathy I saw at work was many years ago. The supervisor caught an employee stealing money from the cash box, basically, and also bank accounts surreptitiously. And the manager had to terminate the employee. But when they had their conversation about what happened, the manager asked, you know, what, what had happened? And the employee told him his story, which was a story of hardship, a story of loss, a story of shame. He was horrified that he did it. And he was horrified that he got caught. And the manager did a beautiful job listening to his story and staying out of judgment. This was a manager who had strong values around stealing. He couldn't imagine having stolen money because it's not something that he would ever do. He, or at least he thought he wouldn't, no matter how hard up he was. Who knows if he was really hard up. But he stayed out of judgment about this employee being a bad person because he stole. And he recognized the emotion that was underpinning their conversation. And he really saw that employee. And he said, I don't even know what to say, but it sounds so hard what you've been up against and also what you're living with now. And I'm, I believe in you and I'm here and thank you for telling me. Now that manager still had to terminate that employee, but about 10 years later, that employee came back to that employer with a hugely changed lifestyle after having suffered some more pain and became a long-term and loyal employee. And I'm, I'm convinced that it was partly based on the effectiveness of that manager staying in empathy, even while he had to do the hard thing, which is to terminate that employee for theft. So empathy is really powerful. It builds connection faster than anything else. To listen. To li I don't want to listen to that right now. Hang on. So I'm going to come back to those last two in a minute, but I want to put you into small groups again because we're coming up against time. And I want to give you a chance to talk about support that might help you navigate the challenges ahead. And also who's on your support team, right? Just say it out loud. The people you're in your small group with maybe don't know who they are, but it could be powerful for you to say it out loud. And if you can't think of anyone, maybe just brainstorm. Who could be if I ask them? And then also, would you share with each other if you have time, what ideas you might use of what we've covered right away to strengthen your and your team's resilience. So just a, a chance to check in with each other about all this content I've been fire hosing you with about what support might help you and what ideas you might be able to use right away. And we will come back and wrap up in about seven minutes. Thanks, Jessica, for sending everybody out. Sure, I'm gonna open the rooms. You may be directed automatically or you may have to click a join button. So here we go. All right, welcome back again from the land of interrupted conversations. And um, I hope you got some ideas. I know my team did share some interesting ideas about what it looks like to get support, how hard it can be sometimes to ask for the support we need, um, and what of the tools are applicable. So thank you. Thanks for talking about that. So I'm gonna just share my screen for a couple of sort of wrap concepts, and then I want to make sure that we have a few minutes for questions. So if you have a question that you really want to ask me, feel free to put it in the chat now um, while we just sort of bring it home here. Um, let's see. So I wanted to just, you know, we've talked about how we rise and the term that I've really come to think a lot about is what does resilience actually mean in terms of how we rise? And I looked it up in the dictionary and I found this definition and it's actually one that's used to describe the 
the tensile strengths of metal, different kinds of metal like steel and aluminum. And it talks about the capability of a strained body to recover its size and shape after deformation caused, especially by compressive stress. And I actually really like this right now as we come through COVID and into our new normal to think about, okay, it has been deforming. We have suffered. We have been through a lot. We have had loss. Our jobs have changed. Our, our families have changed. And how do we reform into this new normal in a way that facilitates recovery and adjustment? Um, so I love that definition of resilience and I wanted to share it with you. And, and there are consistently three characteristics that we see in people that have developed the skill of resilience and that you can see them on the screen now. One is that they get that things happen. So part of a courage practice and part of a resilience practice is recognizing that things do not always go perfectly. That's not how the world works. So just knowing that sometimes things happen is a huge piece of that bounce back. Resilient people are also really good at choosing carefully where to direct their attention. So not over focusing on the things that are keeping them bent out of shape or not being resilient. Instead, turning their eye, turning their energy to the things that are life-giving, that are connecting, that are building trust. These folks don't diminish the negative but they've also worked out a way of turning into the good. And it's not about, I'm just gonna pretend that bad things aren't happening because we have grief, we have loss, we have stress. We need to be in those feelings too. But as we move through them, we also want to remember that our resilience is partly about moving through them and into a bounce back, a new normal, a new normal. So I wanna leave this on the screen for you while we take a couple questions because I do have a bunch of tools about leading and I'm using the definition of leadership quite broadly here. I see a leader as anyone, anyone in any position who can see the potential in people and who has the courage to activate that potential. So if you're not leading people, these tools still apply to you. And all you need to do is text your email address to this number and I'll send you um, my top five things to really help you lead and partner like you never imagined. So those are just some free resources that I want to share with you to help you in your bounce back as you go. And you will also be receiving from the team, the 30 day roadmap that I mentioned earlier. Um, you'll get that in the conference proceedings as well. So I'm hoping there's been something valuable for you here. And I wanna just create a little bit of space in our last few minutes for any questions that you're sitting with. Is there anything I've covered that you're just wondering like how on earth would that work? Or that you'd like me to unpack more deeply? Go ahead and put them in the chat or just take yourself off mute and ask straight up. And it could, if it's not a question, it could just be a reaction something you've noticed that we've been talking about that really strikes you. And although right now we do not have any questions that came up in the chat. Cool. Anybody want to say anything? Take yourself off mute if you do. Okay, so one question did come through. What positive things to others turn towards? Hmm. What positive things do others turn towards? Yeah, I love that. I find I'm, there may be some people that want to comment on this as well, but from my experience, sometimes it's often like the little things even, you know, like for me, I've noticed my resilience really improving when I, get out of my own mind sort of and walk like I love going out to my garden and noticing like what's growing there um, it can be really little things like oh look a new flower came or I have a tomato on my vine you know small successes small things maybe it's the feeling of um, gosh somebody I love got a new job or they made a beautiful quiche or you know small positive things that maybe we're just missing because we're so sort of down, burned out, feeling so exhausted that we're missing those things that actually might enliven us. I see some love 
I love some of the things in the chat, like finding joy in small things, talking to people. Um, yeah. I just love the example of seeing a tomato on a vine, especially one of my vines, because if I know I grew something and it's actually flowering, <laughs> it's a huge accomplishment. Totally. Totally. It is. And I think a lot of times we just, we just miss it because we get, we do get burned down and we get kind of downtrodden and, and these little things can help us enliven. And remember, you know what, we're not alone. We can get through this. Um, and we have to find joy in some of those small things. Another thing that I sometimes find is that reading or listening to music or watching a great movie, like those sort of mental escapes are sometimes also really helpful to recenter us around like overthinking what's hard about this moment. Um, and those seven things from the Gosies, I think are also great examples of little things. All right, we also have a question if there is a summary of all these great tools that can be located somewhere. Yes, so um, Kathy, I think what we'll do is send two things. We'll send the 30 day roadmap, which has most of the main tools. And then we also can send a PDF of the slides themselves. Um, with a list at the bottom of that, I can list some of the resources I mentioned, if that's helpful. And then can you all get that out to the attendees? Most definitely. And this session was recorded as well, too. So you can revisit it as needed um, if you would like to take a look at it. Great. I'm going to just put in the chat as well that number because I didn't keep that slide up too long in case you want to see it and get that free stuff in addition to the stuff we've talked about. 2036755. So just text your email and you'll get that automatically. Um, yeah, gratitude is such an important piece. And I, I know for me, I sometimes just forget what I'm grateful for. I've, I've actually sometimes even started to practice in these COVID times of saying, what am I grateful for today? Because it helps me notice the good stuff, you know? So I love, I love that that was mentioned. Well, good stuff. Let me share one final slide with you as it's sort of a summary and a takeaway for you to think about. And, and um, in my experience, there are eight things that can help us with how we're showing up in these hard times and in these transitions post COVID. We can tend to our heart, our emotions, they matter. They matter in many cases, even more than our brain and what we know. Put down armor that gets in the way by doing things like asking for help, by being vulnerable, owning and telling our story. Feel with, which is about both empathy and self-compassion, practicing both. Noticing and completing your stress cycle, giving yourself permission to process through those stressors and to remember that you have a body and that your body helps you process those hard feelings. We sometimes at work, we think of ourselves as like, heads that are detached from our body, but our body has a huge role in this work. Practice big boundaries, integrity, generosity with our teams. Listen and lean in softly and remember you are enough. You are enough, you are good enough, you are smart enough, you are experienced enough, talented enough, caring enough to do the job that you're doing. And um, so, so thank you. I think that I love what uh, Mimi said about vulnerability. And yes, it, many of us are raised to think that vulnerability is not a good thing. And so we have to unlearn that. And vulnerability also, it, 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 um, what is vulnerable for me may be very different than what's vulnerable for someone else based on identity cards. So we wanna be sensitive to the nuanced dimensions of vulnerability with how we show up. Well, I know you, ha you have a really exciting a couple of days ahead of you with great content. And I hope that it all goes really well. I look forward to hearing from you if you put any of these things into practice. And I wanna thank the conference organizers, Greta and Kathy and Jessica for the logistical help. It's just been a delight to be with you. And, um, and so thank you. Thank you so much, Mo. We really appreciated having you here and all the insights you brought to us and all the tools that we'll be able to use. Absolutely. Yes, ditto to what um, Kathy just said. Mo, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Um, you know, sometimes you you know these things and you've heard these things. Mo, you may have heard these things before, but just even hearing them again today where we are in this state right now was absolutely um, 
awesome. And I think everyone, whether they put something in the chat or not, I think everyone was able to um, take something away from the nuggets of information that you have given us this morning. So again, thank you, thank you, thank you.